Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Jennifer Milliard to the show. She is a science journalist and co-presenter of the Awesome Astronomy Podcast, and we'll talk about amateur astronomy and bringing science to everyone. We're also going to hear from Dr. Tara Murphy of the University of Sydney about her recent discovery of strange radio signals coming from near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. In addition, we learn of a solar system that looks much like our own family of planets will look in the distant future following the death of our sun. Plus, we're going to peer in deeper at those odd radio signals from the center of the galaxy and get, a, and get a sneak preview of our upcoming conversation with Dr. Murphy. Astronomers using the ASCAP network of radio telescopes in Australia have discovered an unusual object somewhat near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, radio waves from these bursts vary in brightness a hundred times, from their dimmest to their brightest. This signal is also intermittent. It keeps going in and out, and so this display does not seem to match up with anything else seen in visible light or wave or any other wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Astronomers suggest it may be a previously unknown type of object. On the 2nd of November, we're going to talk with Dr. Tara Murphy of the University of Sydney about this discovery. Here's a sneak preview of that upcoming interview. One of our hypotheses was that this was a flaring star. So I mentioned at the beginning the circular polarization. That's a very strange property of of light. That means that um, the light is not only aligned in a single plane, but that plane is rotating as it's traveling towards us. And the two types of objects that uh, cause that the most are pulsars and stars when they are flaring. So we thought this could be a stellar flare, but when we search for it in visible light, we see nothing. For a star to be that bright, to be flaring that brightly, but yet not visible in optical visible light, it means that um, it pretty much rules out that a hypothesis or it's a very, very, very cool dim star and we need uh, better observations to try and find it. A Jupiter-like world 6,500 light years from Earth orbits a stellar corpse of a star that was once much like our own sun. This exoplanet orbits the white dwarf star at approximately the same distance from the center of that system as Jupiter keeps from the sun. This is the first world yet found whose orbit appears unchanged by the death of its parent star. This finding suggests that Jupiter is likely to survive a similar demise of the Sun in about 5 billion years. The Earth, however, is unlikely to be as lucky. The first samples from the asteroid Ryugu have arrived at Earth and are being examined at the Argonne National Laboratory. On the 2nd of November, we're going to talk with Dr. Erkan Elp, a lead researcher on this historic study. Make sure to join us then. Next up, we talk with science journalist Dr. Jennifer Milliard about astronomy, science, and the innate human wonder about the cosmos. (music) 
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Millard. She is a science journalist and co-presenter of the awesome Astronomy Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. So I think I know, have some idea of what brought me to this point in in life, but what was your path to becoming a science journalist? Oh, extremely convoluted and unexpected. Um, I guess this wasn't entirely where I always expected to find myself. So I started really getting into sort of science communication during my undergraduate degree because they would have the you know, these way active students are coming and things like that. And they'd always want volunteers. So I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll help out with that. And I really enjoyed it. I sort of really, you know, enjoyed talking to people about general science and like what the university does. From that then, I got invited to participate in workshops for primary schools. So then that was doing, you know, demonstrations to classes about, you know, how the stars work, how big the solar system, all sorts of things like that. And then that, you know, I just kind of fell in love with it then. And I kept up um, all sorts of outreach during my degree so I progressed to doing sort of talks at museums and things like that at star parties and at other astronomy clubs and then I, once I finished my undergraduate degree I went on to do my PhD and I just kind of kept doing more and more science communication throughout my PhD and as much as I love research and everything I just my true passion is science communication and so this is where I found myself and science journalism actually came about through my podcast so I was originally a guest on the podcast many many moons ago and then well I think I did a good job because they then invited me to be a host and so I've been co-hosting and writing it you know for, for years and years now and I got my job as a science journalist um, with Sky Guide to so the app that I write for through the podcast they, they happened to listen to it and they were like Jen I think you're great you know do you want to write for us and I was like yeah sure so I started doing that a couple of times a month when I was still doing my PhD because obviously that's a full-time position um, and now that I finished I've been working for them part-time and kind of expanding all the other sort of science communication and science journalism I do and I've ended up you know, on BBC radio, BBC TV and it's just kind of going a little bit crazy. I don't really know why. I just kind of say yes to opportunities when they present themselves. <laughs> that seems to be the trick is just say yes even if you don't feel confident that you can do it you can surprisingly mm -hmm. say say yes now and figure out how later yeah yeah exactly like <laughs> I, I did some videos for a company um this company contacted me and they were like oh we're doing an away day and it's space themed and we'd love it if you could do some sort of destination videos different places around the solar system and i was like yeah sure i hadn't made videos before i was like yeah i'll figure it out as i go along and they were you know super happy with it so yeah it's just taking opportunities when they present themselves as long as you think that they're going to be fun i do don't do anything that you think is going to be super stressful or, or anything but right. yeah just say yeah that's great and you know i i I'd like to wonder like what is it about human nature that drives us to explore the cosmos Oh, see, now I think if you could answer that, you would answer many questions about human nature. I don't know what it is. We just have this innate drive to explore. Right? I think it's just kind of ingrained in us because we, you know, right from when we were leaving our roots in Africa, you know, we were exploring then. And then, you know, we've explored all the way through our history. We've just got this innate drive to just go and do things and go and find things even if we're not really ready or capable for them you know it's like when we explored Antarctica we were absolutely not ready for it we didn't have the equipment the clothing like the, the food and everything that we needed but we still did it and you know it's amazing to see how far we've come in terms of space exploration would anyone have said at the beginning of the 20th century that we would have landed on the moon in the 60s absolutely not you know, that guy here it was even a popular saying in the late 19th century, that's as impossible as walking on the moon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things you and I have in common is a love of star parties. We've both directed star parties, but 
for those of people for those people out there who may have never attended one or may may have never heard the term, what are star parties and what makes them so interesting? Oh, star parties, I think, are the, the best place on earth, really. They're just gatherings of like minded people who just want to stay up late, do astronomy, and usually have a few beers or two if that's your persuasion. Uh, they're just fantastic places to really kind of just share your love of astronomy and space, um, explore the night sky using, you know, all sorts of different equipment. You don't have to have a telescope or binoculars to attend a star party. You know, people are very welcome to, you know, share and, and show what the view looks like in different types of telescopes. They're great places if you are thinking about buying a telescope or maybe a pair of binoculars, you're not sure how much you want to spend, you're not sure what sort of telescope you want to go to. If you go to a star party, you can explore all of these options for free and then make a wise investment. But I think really the best thing about star parties is that they're always held in dark sky areas. So regions where there's very, very little light pollution and you can actually see, you know, the sort of number of stars that all the early astronomers would have been able to see because they didn't have the big cities with all of the light pollution. And you're know, just seeing that Milky Way kind of just popping out from the sky and losing constellations because there are just so many stars. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And they can also be a great education as well. You know, lots of star parties have, have talks or maybe workshops and interesting things to do. But yeah, you can just really immerse yourself in the world of astronomy and just you know, fall in love with it all over again. Yeah, I totally agree with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I just, I just uh, have to say, I just love that look, like when you have a child, especially adults as well, but especially a child looking through a telescope at the first, the, for the first time, Oh, yeah. you know, and especially like something dramatic, like the rings of Saturn. Yes. You know, yeah. seeing it, you know, eight year old kids seeing the rings of Saturn for the first time is just... Just anyone seeing the rings of Saturn or, or Jupiter and you can see all of those, you know, the stripes, the different colours. You can see those four Galilean moons. And one of my favourite things to do at a star party is, you know, fingers crossed, you have clear nights for sort of several evenings on the go. And you can watch the Galilean moons sort of change in position night by night as they're continuing to orbit Jupiter. Even during one night, you can kind of look at it at the start of the night and then return to it several hours later. And you'll see that the moons have changed positions, you know, and that was one of the founding observations that really changed our perception of, um, of our solar system. And it's amazing that we can see what Galileo was seeing, you know, 400 years ago. Oh, I just love it. Yeah, it really humanizes history, I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, now you recently came back from Astro Camp. What was, I what was that like? Oh my gosh, it was it was a mixed bag in terms of the weather, but the overall event was absolutely fantastic. So Astro Camp is, I am now officially an organizer of Astro Camp. I'm so excited. Exactly. Yeah, because I've sort of been on the sort of the edges of organizing Astro Camp. So this is a, a twice a year star party that's held in the Brecon Beacons in Wales. So it's in one of the dark sky areas of the UK. And um, it's Usually so it's September, October, and then April, May, depending on where the moon falls and, you know, when bank holidays are and things like that. And it's Saturday to Tuesday, and we just have, you know, we have a common area, which is quite unusual with star parties. So we have one region in the middle of the campsite where we encourage everyone to go and set up their telescopes, no matter where they're camping or where their caravan is, so that everyone can sort of stargaze together you can mm -hmm. try out IP system people, you can try out filters, you know, someone will just say, hey, I'm looking at the Andromeda galaxy. Does anyone want to come and look? And you just get a rush of people going across to have a look at this galaxy that maybe they've never had the opportunity to see before. And it was the first time Astro Camp has happened in two years. And it was just fantastic to see all of sort of my Astro Camp friends who I haven't seen for two years because of, you know, the, the dreaded coronavirus. I, I, I hate bringing it up, but yeah, it's... um. So it was quite reality. emotional. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was quite emotional because of that aspect of it. But, um, oh, it was fantastic. We had uh, two really good nights. A third night there was a bit in and out with the weather. And one night it was just torrential rain. It was really funny because, um, so Ashokan, where we are, we're in a valley. 
and it's like a little microclimate. It can say on the weather forecast, oh, it's going to be pouring rain. There's no chance. And yet we'll have beautiful, clear skies, you know, Milky Way, just so prominent overhead. And yeah, so when it was raining, we sort of all caught up with each other and swapped stories. And then when it was stargazing, we all had a, had a great time just looking at nebulae and star clusters and galaxies. And yeah, it's fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Kind of got my love for astronomy back a little bit. That's great. And for people who have a love of astronomy but may not be able to make it out to star parties, what sort of, you know, you write, um, you know, for a star guide, and, um, but what, what sort of things should people be looking for in the sky and what's, what's easy for people to see? So it depends, you know, how much light pollution you've got. If you're suffering with a lot of light pollution, even if you live in a big city, you can always see planets. Um, they're always a big one. Um, so at the minute, we, it's actually a great time for planets. So we've got Saturn and Jupiter are really, really bright in the southern sky. Um, Jupiter in particular, Jupiter is the brighter of the two, but you'll see kind of reasonably low on the southern horizon, you see what looks like a really, really bright star. And that will be Jupiter. And then to the right of it, then you'll have fainter, but still reasonably bright, you'll have Saturn. So that's something to look out for. They're both binocular objects. You don't even need, you know, a telescope to see them. A pair of binoculars will show you the Galilean moons. You'll be able to see the rings of Saturn too. Uh, we've got... Um, it's an interesting time actually to try and find Mercury and Venus, which are the inferior planets, so the planets that orbit the sun within Earth's orbit. And um, we've inferior got Mercury. Inferior planets are planets too. <laughs> <laughs> they are, and they can be really tricky to see um, because they never stray too far from the sun, right? particularly Mercury. Right. But Mercury on the 25th is reaching greatest western elongation which is just a fancy term to say it's at its greatest distance from the sun so it's a morning object at the minute if you get up really early on the 25th before the sun rises um mercury will be 16 degrees above the horizon so you'll need a nice clear eastern horizon but you can actually see the closest planet to the sun and venus at the minute is an evening object so I think the best time to see Venus is on the 29th. That's when it's reaching its greatest distance from the sun and it's half illuminated at the minute. So if you've got a telescope, you can see Venus half illuminated. It's moving towards Earth on its, orb on its orbit. So it's going to get bigger, but it's also going to get fainter as we can see less and less of that illuminated side. So yeah, 29th uh, on the evening for Venus and then yeah, 25th morning for Mercury. And of course, you've got Jupiter and Saturn, moon's always great to have a look at as well. There are the Orionids, meteor shower, but I really think they're a washout this year. The full yeah, moon's about, full moon, right? yeah, they're, they're normally 20 um, per hour with the full moon we're expecting too. So it's just like, if you happen to see a, a nice bright meteor when you're out and about stargazing, might be an Orionid, but yeah, not not one to sort of stay up for, unfortunately this year, spoiled by the blue moon, by the full moon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. And just uh, so for how, how can people learn more about what it is that you're doing and about your work? You can download the app that I work for for free, which is great. <laughs> Everyone loves a free app. It's, it's been completely revamped to be way more user friendly. So it's called Sky Guide. It's available on the App Store. And I write featured articles for them. So that's all stories about what's going on in the news. I think my latest one is all about Aurora in the solar system because we've got a new Aurora feature in the app. And then I think the next one is going to be all about uh, La Palma and why on earth we build volcano, build telescopes on volcanoes. Because, you know, it's an interesting question to explore. And then there's also the podcast, just twice a month, just Google Awesome Astronomy, will come up. And uh, the first one is all about astronomy, and the second one is all about space exploration. So, you know, rockets and telescopes and things like that. Great. Thanks so much for being on the show, Jennifer. It was great talking with you. It was fantastic. Thank you for having me. Nice. And that was uh, Dr. Jennifer Millard, a science journalist and co-presenter of the Awesome Astronomy Podcast. Check it out. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun, informative interviews. 
Next week, we present a special Halloween episode featuring a spooky interview with Erica Engelhardt, author of Gory Details. She's going to be teaching us about the science of Halloween. How cool, huh? We're also going to see new original photographs of some of the scariest objects in the night sky. And there's going to be a whole lot of other treats in there for you kids. Make sure to join us then starting on the 26th of October. The Spooky Science of Halloween with Erica Engelhaupt, author of Gory Details, coming the 26th of October to thecosmiccompanion.net. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early, together with advanced viewings of comics, jokes, and a whole lot more. Sign up by the end of the month. Get two weeks free. Check out our, check out our website, for more details. Now, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of the show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.